Welcome everybody. Um, I wanted to do an update on my solar panel uh, recording that I made about a year ago. I've had solar installed in my house in Ireland now um, for a full year and I wanted to just kind of give an update on the session I did previously. I'll put a link in this video and you can go watch that one. I told a lot about um, what you're going to do if you're thinking about buying it and building it. I uh, gave a lot of good advice, but it's a year old now, and some of the stuff is still accurate, and some of it maybe needs an update. So um, just jump in now and kind of talk about what I, um, what I covered in that session. So the first area that I talked about really was starting with your usage. So um, that's still the case, right? People ask me all the time, should I get uh, solar panels or not? I think I mentioned in the video that, you know, don't just ask your neighbor. Do your own math, do your own research. So, for example, I mentioned that uh, 4,200 um, kilowatt hours is the average of a household in Ireland consuming, right, uh, for the total year, okay? Um, that could be two bedroom, three bedroom, multiple people in the house. That's all the electrical appliances. That's everything that you're paying for. Um, what we've noticed, obviously, in the last year is the price of that electricity per unit has gone up. And what people kind of ignored before about the electricity bill, um, now all of a sudden it's multiples of what they came to expect. So now they're starting to think, is there a way of beating that? Can I maybe install solar panels and save all this money? So in some cases you might be able to, in some cases you aren't. But you have to start with that original number. As I said in the session last year, uh, I had five people in the house and I was over 20 kilowatts a day. 4,200 uh, for the year is actually only um, 11 per day, right? So if you're only consuming uh, 11 kilowatts per day, you're going to have a different size system than somebody that's, that's, that's consuming 20, 30, 40, and beyond. The more electricity uh, devices that you have in the house, maybe if your heating system is based on electricity, heat pumps and things like that, your consumption level is going to be different. I also talk about um, location being very important for solar. So depending on where you're um, planning uh, to, to place your solar panels, uh, the best place of all is south facing, right? So this is true. I'm actually, um, the roof in my house is east-west. So I don't get as much as somebody who builds a system that's south facing. And a south facing roof, you can build a smaller system that costs a little bit less money and you can generate as much and even more than somebody like me who has to design a bigger system east-west facing uh, because I'm not getting as much sunlight directly hitting it. In my last video, I have a link to a online calculator. You put in your location and your details. You tell it the aspect of your roof and it will literally tell you down to the day how much sunshine you can expect to get. And as I said uh, in the last session, it is deadly accurate. When I put in the correct amount of, of, of my site in my house, it was almost every month exactly perfect into how much it estimated um, I would be able to generate. Uh, Ireland is still a great place to use solar panels. It just isn't always sunny in the wintertime. So if you're trying to buy solar to save your um, heating bills because your heating bills is based on electricity, you need to kind of double think that and, and do the math. Now, a big part of this that I want to update is, you know, simply put, last year we talked about, you know, whether you do DIY or you put an inverter in the house. Um, the main thing is to build, you know, either a, a ground mounted or a roof mounted system, right? Depends on what aspect you have. If you went ground mounted, then maybe you can angle it and direct it south facing a little bit easier than if your fixed roof like mine is east west. Um, you have to make that choice. Um, I put 19 panels on my roof, half of them on the east side, half of them on the west side. So I get a little performance in the morning. I get some performance in the evening, and then in the middle of the day, that's when both of my panels are, are contributing equally and I get my peak performance. So that peak that I'm getting is midday, about um, anywhere from 12.30 to 1.30, depending on the time of year, that's when I get the most amount of generation 
And that means what we talked about in the last video is self-consumption, right? You should be designing your system to be able to self-consume the electricity you generate. That is a key kind of aspect of this, right? If you're generating lots of electricity in midday and you're off at work and you're not there to actually consume it, how are you going to use that energy you generated? Okay. Now we have a couple of options for that. You could uh, turn on some devices remotely in your house and you could make that energy go directly into your house load. So I started using things like smart plugs. Um, they're really cheap. You can buy them, install them in a device, like for example, your dishwasher. What I can do is in the morning, load up the dishwasher, turn it on, and then with the app on my phone, turn off the smart plug. And then when I notice that the system is peaking and lots of generation is, is going into my house, I can turn the smart plug on and all of a sudden the dishwasher starts from there. A lot of more modern devices have that timer built in. You can have a delay timer, for example, set it in the morning and tell it to come on a few hours later, or maybe even your device is smart enough to actually tell it come on at exactly this time of day. Now, some people would argue don't want to run devices when no one's home because risk of fire and things like that. Um, uh, I, I hear you, and I'm not going to comment one way or, or another on that. You know, make sure that uh, the electrical wiring and everything is, is up to spec in your house. But I can make really smart use of consuming my electricity when my system is at peak. And I, and I do that with something like smart plugs and, and automation, right? And it isn't expensive to kind of implement. Um, another area is if you have peak electricity and you're not home during the day, well then, what about a battery, right? Should I deploy a battery? Now, this is one of the biggest areas that I wanted to um, kind of talk about. Uh, a year ago, I was up for debate when I was presenting this. At the time, the government grant was getting pulled for the battery. Um, we used to get, um, you know, uh, I can't remember how much it was exactly, but several hundred euros from the government. If you added a battery into your system at install time, the government stopped doing that, I think, last February. So um, anybody who's looking at solar to install now, you're doing it without that benefit of the grant. At the same time, we've had the supply chain issues. So the price of a battery to add to a system has, and I'm sorry, I'm using the dollar sign, but, uh, I, I, uh, or the euro, whatever, the price has gone up um, and it's gone up dramatically, right? And people ask me all the time, you've got a battery, I should put a battery in my system. And I say, look, go out and get your quotes, get a quote for a system without a battery, get a quote for a system with a battery. One thing is if you're buying from a supplier, they also have a stock. So they may not want to give you the exact cost of the quote in the price. They're gonna give you the total solution and it includes a battery and you gotta take it, right? Um, there's a lot of things you can think about when you're designing the battery uh, for your system or not. If you don't put a battery in, then you don't necessarily need to have an inverter that can accommodate a battery. You could run the whole system without a battery. And one of the reasons this is uh, a really good option is that one thing that I talked about last year was um, a thing called the feed-in tariff, right? So, oops, I messed something up doing this. Um, at the time, there was a lot of talk about the proposed feed-in tariff that was coming. Now, this is where any electricity that you don't use that goes to house load, if it's excess, it can go directly back to the grid. You can actually export power onto the grid for the energy uh, companies to reuse and actually resell when you need it later, right? So in the evening, when the sun goes down uh, and you actually need more power, um, you might have to pull back from the grid. Well, they're happy to sell it back to you. The feed-in tariff, uh, we weren't expecting it last year to come in anything greater than five cents, right? What's actually happened is that some providers are multiples of that. So I think the smallest one is 18 cents, and I've seen some providers that are up around 21, 22, 23, 24 cents. Um, there's other countries where this feed-in tariff price is even higher at certain peak times, right? So it's a good idea to keep an eye on that fit. Um, you, can, you can absolutely bet that 
whatever price they're paying you for that export, yes, you're going to benefit from that. But when you go to buy it back, I bet you it's even more expensive. So we're seeing, you know, 40 and 50 cents uh, for a unit of electricity coming back from the grid if you want to buy it at peak times, for example, right? So you have to watch that. Uh, another thing to, to focus on, which I talked about last year, was what about the meter, right? Um, at the time, we had 24-hour meters, we had a day-night meter, and we have the dreaded smart meter, right? Now I say dreaded because, um, as, as I mentioned last year, we don't know what's happening in this space, but you're being mandated to put a smart meter in all homes by a certain date, right? They continue to roll out smart meters, but there's been plenty of articles in the last year that have said a lot of people have a smart meter, but they have not opted in for a smart tariff because doing the math, Irish people are really smart. They're looking at going, hey, this isn't saving me any money. This is actually costing me more. You told me that a smart meter would, would save me money. Um, we have yet to see, now maybe I'll be doing uh, another update in a year from now, we've yet to see any of the savings from smart meters be passed on to the customer. Surprise, surprise. 24-hour meter means you have one price all year long or, or, or all day long, you pay the same amount. Um, a smart meter means there might be a couple of different levels during the day. The way they're trying to move is to be able to look at what is the peak amount of electricity being used and the electric, electric companies want to be able to, to charge the most during that peak. You can guarantee that's going to be a time that doesn't suit you in terms of trying to save money. It'll be dinner time. It'll be from 5 p.m., 6 p.m. into 7 and 8 p.m., right? At the moment, uh, I'm still on a day-night meter. So when I got the solar system installed, I had a 24-hour meter. And I read up and I learned that the best thing for me to do was switch to a day-night meter before they installed a smart meter. Once you have a day-night meter installed in your home, if you have one, it's like the tracker mortgages. Stay on it. Keep using the day-night meter because that seems to be the best value for people who are A, having solar panels, but also can do, do a thing called um, load shifting. So I do a lot of uh, self-consumption and I do a lot of load shifting. And what that basically means is um, in my house, uh, we try and move all of our electrical big tasks, things that heat water, wash clothes, do the dishes, uh, those kind of things. We can't move the cooking. We move that to after 11 p.m. at night, right? Uh, and my uh, cheap day night or night rate is after 11 to about 8 a.m. And that's winter time. In the summer, it shifts by an hour. So you got to keep keep track of when that time shifts with your, your supplier, but they're all pretty much the same. There's also a, um, an EV rate, right? Which you need to, keep, to be aware of. Typically, you can only unlock this um, possibly with a smart meter, depending on the tariffs, right? And it's like maybe a 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. slot, and it's even cheaper again to, to use your electricity then. Well, unless you're up at that time, you're definitely going to have to use automation or, um, you know, smart devices with a scheduler on it or plugging your car in to charge it at that time. And that's what it's targeted for is, is for car charging, right? But there's nothing stopping me from doing something like filling up my battery with um, a night rate, right? Maybe the 2 to 4 a.m. And, and filling it up at that. And then later on during the day, consuming all of that electricity I saved in the battery during the daytime when maybe there isn't sunshine in the winter or when the sun just quite hasn't gotten up high enough and I still need to maybe do the morning tasks uh, in my house or whatever, or even the early evening when maybe the sun starts to set. So um, a battery gives you a lot of flexibility on how you can consume things like a night, a day-night meter and night rate. Um, and it can make you know, when the sun goes behind a cloud, the battery can be used to fill in the electricity when the sun goes away. Because your house load is probably going to be either constant or if you have a device on, it's going to peak a little bit. You know, if you're looking at running things like an oven, you can expect them to be anywhere from two and a half to uh, three kilowatts an hour. Uh, um, a shower could be eight 
kilowatts an hour um, if you use it. Uh, and so typically your battery is going to output about two and a half kilowatts, right? So if the sunshine is feeding in maybe two or three kilowatts and the battery can also do two and a half, well, then you could possibly run multiple di devices like a wash machine and a cooker at the same time. And you can, you can take it from the battery and the, the solar panels at the same time, right? But you got to keep an eye on that. If you don't have enough production from either the panels or if your battery is small and it can't output very much and your house load is very high, you're still going to be pulling from grid, right? So you need to keep that, um, you keep, keep that in mind. Another thing I talked about last year, I was at the time, I didn't install it, is called uh, a hot water diverter or an eddy. And at the time I had made the decision not to install it. Uh, and later on, I actually flip-flopped on that during the year. I got an eddy installed. Basically what an eddy can do is um, uh, your solar panels will go to the house load or they'll go to the battery first and then the house load or they can go to the battery first, and when that's full, they can divert to another device like an eddy, which will heat your hot water tank. So you're basically trying to slow down that excess energy that you're not using at the house load. Before it goes to the grid, you're gonna want to uh, maybe self-consume it and use it in the house. So all of my hot water with excess energy, once the battery is full, I use the eddy device to heat the hot water in my tank. Now. Is it the most efficient way of doing things? Because an eddy can cost about, it's gone up actually, about 500 euros to buy. It's pretty expensive. And if you think about how much you're saving over the space of five or 10 years, it's more of a, um, it's, it's a nice to have. It keeps the water in my house always hot because it's being used to heat, heat the water tank. And in the summer, it's free heat, but um, it is very much a, uh, a practical sort of a, useful device, but it's not critical that you decide to install it. If you have other ways of, of heating the water that are cheaper, um, even um, you know using oil or gas to heat the water, you have to look at how much it's costing you know, um, per unit to, to heat up your tank. And that can vary, right, based on how many people are in the house, how many showers are being taken, how big is your hot water tank. It's not always the smartest way. I actually am kind of leaning back towards the electric shower. The only problem with the electric shower is I have a teenager and the teenager gets into the electric shower and never gets out. So if they spend 60 minutes in the shower, they're gonna consume an hour's worth of electricity and it might be eight kilowatts in that hour. So if I'm <laughs> expecting to use, use, use the average, right? If they do that once or even let's say they're into exercising, and they take two showers a day, you could be at 16 kilowatts if they do two hours of showering, right? So you gotta keep an eye on it. If it's you and you jump in and jump out in, in you know 10 minutes and you have a shower, an electric shower is actually a very efficient way of heating the water because it's on demand, it's, it's when you need it. Um, so keep an eye on that. It doesn't, there isn't one answer that, that solves um, everybody's kind of, uh, solution here. I would, I would recommend you really thinking about how your consumption um, is in the house. Uh, coming back to the battery, the cost of buying a battery from a supplier is expensive. Go out there and price it. It doesn't seem to be coming down yet. I think the combination of the demand and the supply chain means this technology is still pretty expensive. And you can see the payback being about 10 years, right? Now, I don't really want to invest in a technology these days that takes 10 years to get the payback off it. I want something to be a quicker return. My solar panels, now they're supposed to last, say, 20 years plus. Um, uh, things like the inverter have a warranty of five years. You need to be thinking about things. If they fail um, and you have to replace them, that's going to make the time it takes to pay back the investment you made in solar take longer. Battery. Um, you know, let's say you're using 11 kilowatts an hour per day. In the wintertime, if your system um, isn't south facing and there isn't a lot of sun available to you, you might only generate a couple of kilowatts. So you still need to pull energy from the grid to satisfy the rest of that number, right? That you're consuming every day. Battery sounds like this is a great idea. I can fill up the battery at night rate, consume it during the day, 
Um, but the more this, the larger this number here is per day that you're using electricity, if you're up into the 20 kilowatts plus per day, you're gonna need a battery that can fill up that much, right? And by filling and draining a battery, you're gonna have maybe 10 or 20% losses as well. So you have to factor that in. For me, if I was to build a battery that would completely remove me from the need for the grid, right? Except for filling up the battery at night, um, I wouldn't need to use any daytime or day rate, the expensive units that we have to pay for now. I'd have to have a very big battery. So my battery is actually five kilowatts in size. I bought it with a grant. For someone to go and buy that now, I'm seeing prices of two and a half, three thousand euros a go for say five kilowatts. If you want to um, put four batteries in at five kilowatts and, and have exactly 20 kilowatts to use, well then, you know, you're talking quadruple that, that cost. That is big money. And I don't know if you'd get that ever paid back. So I think there's a nice balance. You can use the, the solar generation to reduce uh, um, a good part of the year when the sun is there and um, uh, really, really reduce your bills. But it isn't a silver bullet because we don't have the same amount of sunshine all year round. The, the, the tough months are um, kind of after November. Um, you could even maybe count November as a tough month. November is tough. December isn't great, and January is pretty weak in Ireland in terms of output of, of sun, right? The sun is very low in the sky, and it doesn't stay till 11 o'clock at night, right? The sunset is quite early, four, half four in the afternoon. Already this month, February, is when I'm talking about this now, I'm already seeing some, I saw 10 kilowatts, for example, yesterday from my system in a single day being produced. I was delighted with that. I was running around the house, turning on the dishwasher. I was working from home, turning on the dishwasher, making sure there was a load of laundry on wash and dry. I was struggling to make sure there was no output. Now you might ask, why do I care about doing that? Why don't I just go back and use this fit rate um, and get paid for my electricity? Well, because I'm on a day-night meter, this is not a little secret, and I'll kind of finish on this. The day-night meter means, um, it's not a smart meter, so the electricity companies cannot measure my exact uses, usage, right? They've agreed with the um, government or whatever that they're going to pay people a deemed expert export. So based on the size of the system I deploy, how many panels? So I have 19 panels, they're about 340 watt. So my system is 6.5 um, kilowatts of power, right? different thing to kilowatts per hour. That's the size of my system. Um, the, the math on that, the deemed export means they basically pay me about 300 euros per year whether I export anything or not. Now that won't last forever. At some point they're gonna force me onto a smart meter and they're gonna measure every single unit that I export to the grid or don't export. And then my, you know I'll have to relook at the, at, at the uh, fit rate. But right now I'm targeting um, Basically, I'm not gonna name a, a supplier. You gotta do your own due diligence, use something um, you know, like bonkers and go evaluate what's out there. But I'm looking for a, a provider that's gonna give me a nice high rate of fit, right? But also offer me a good um, night rate as well. Uh, and there's a couple of providers I think that are quite good um, uh, you know, to sign up for. Um, I also um, want to be able to flex and change if the market drastically changes this year. Kind of hoping that you know things ease up and we start to see, like we're seeing at the petrol pump, prices start to come down again. I'm hoping that that starts to feed through. I'm hoping it doesn't mean the fit rate will start to drop, right? But I'm sure they'll pass on <laughs> that and uh, start dropping that rate. But we'll see, we'll see. Maybe I'll do an update in a year on this. Um, uh, that's it. I'll, I'll include some links to my old uh, session. It's still, it's a bit long, but it's still worth listening um, to what I talked about in it. And um, a lot of links to formulas and things like that. And if you're looking for a lot of detailed advice, absolutely recommend boards.ie uh, like I did last year. Lots of people there, lots of forums. You can ask detailed questions. You can get a, you can get a you know, two or three quotes and get people to actually give you advice on which quote is good, which is too expensive you know, what to go with. So that's it. Thanks, everybody. Uh, talk to you later.